It's great to see everybody. I think this is our eighth year. <clears throat> I'll be taking you for an exercise on four to 20 milliamp control circuits. And that in our industry is probably one of the most difficult circuits for students to understand and one of the most that's commonly messed up in the field. My goal today with all of you is that you'll be able to leave here and wire a four to 20 milliamp circuit from memory, no problem, right? And you'll be able to teach your students how to do that too um, because that's a big problem in our field is uh, technicians messing that circuit up. So that's one of the main goals. Um, how many of you were at the Summer Institute for Building Automation and uh, Man uh, Metropolitan Community College? Okay, so I put this also in a lesson plan so that you can take it back to your home institutions, play around with it a little bit, and then deliver it. The idea is that you take it home and deliver the exercise, improve it a little bit, and, um, and then implement it uh, in your programs. So we'll ask you to do a report out at the end of the session today. You'll be uh, pushed for time, so I want to get, get out of here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a primer when we get over there on EZIO. I think most of you have probably been exposed to EZIO as an environment, the Sedona platform. We've been, we've been using that for a couple years. Um, I'll also uh, cover the basics of four to 20 milliamp circuits and then introduce you to the exercise and break you up into teams. Um, what we thought is, starting in Robert Croom's row coming forward, all of you on this side, except for the last row, will come with Ted and myself, and the rest will go with Hadley to do the ultrasonic uh, exercise. How many of you on this side of the room would say that you're competent in basic DC electrical? Okay, that's enough, okay. We'll be asking you to pair up with those who are less competent, okay, because, um, like I said, we'll be pushed to get this exercise done in the time that we have. Okay, so let's jump into it. Um, again, stop me at any time, but not too much, because we gotta get through this. So this is a four to 20 milliamp loop exercise. The reason we chose this exercise, I don't think we've ever covered this before in seven or eight years. And, and when I thought about that, that's insane, because this is one of the most commonly encountered circuits that there is in our industry but it's also the one that's most difficult to get right, and it's the one as a former employer in controls that drove me crazy because my guys would, half the time they'd get it wrong and it would generate a service call. We're gonna correct that, but the goal for today is that by the time we leave, everybody here, doggone it, will be comfortable with the circuit, enough to wire it up from memory. We're gonna give you some, some ways to um, think about the circuit that take the complexity away. And if you find them useful, please take them back, share them with your students so that your students can walk out of your programs with this competency. If they have this competency, almost this competency, DC electrical, basic understanding of IO, I can almost guarantee they'll get a job just with that much, okay? Okay, so the purpose of the exercise is to provide an engaging exercise you can use at your home institution to develop competency in constructing four to 20 milliamp circuits. We're gonna do a two wire circuit, this is a source, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, sinking circuit from the perspective of the controller, we'll talk about that. You'll gain broader experience with peripheral devices. Uh, we have them all laid out in front of you and we're gonna be utilizing the trainers over here and in the next room. So each of you have your own trainer that you're gonna be wiring on, okay? And a refresher lesson on um, lesson development. One thing we've learned over the course of the last seven or eight years, one of the biggest failings we as instructors around the country at the technical college level are planning lessons out, laying out lessons properly. And we talked a lot about that at the Summer Institute. Uh, we've, we've come up with development, lesson plan development templates that we shared at that institute. They're also in this drive, both for PBL exercises and for just basic lesson plan development. They're available to you. If you find them useful, please, please make use of them. The common elements of the lesson plan, and then we'll go through how this lesson was planned in this format, the title, the length of the lesson, et cetera, the learning objectives. I'm not gonna bore you to death with a discussion about Bloom's taxonomy, although I'd love to, because I love that topic. <laughs> it, it helped my program. Yeah, I know, Ted always goes to sleep when I talk about it. But um, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Peter always reminds me, attitudes for the effective, affective, emotional domain, very important in teaching. The hook or the set, how are you gonna engage your students and keep them from sleeping when they've worked all day. You gotta have some kind of hook or some kind of 
way to get them engaged so that they're going to absorb what it is you're about to teach. The instructional narrative, the longest section of the lesson plan, um, risk assessment, what could go wrong, okay? Um, the practice, the application, of course, the assessment and the evaluation, how you're going to evaluate students. For this exercise, you're going to be reporting out what you learned in the exercise. That's, that's how we'll do our evaluation. The summation, reflection, then the bridging to other content, and I'm rushing through this because of time constraints, but how are you going to bridge this to further learning, how this acts as a scaffold for later learning and lessons you'll have in your programs. So um, when I laid out this exercise, I wanted to use this template, and I just took screenshots of this. The whole thing is in that Google Drive, so it's available to you. Obviously, we know the course and where we're at. Uh, the required materials, we'll be using all these materials in this exercise. I tried to make an exhaustive list so that you know exactly what you'll need when you go home to your institutions. Um, most of it's right in front of you. The rest of the stuff on this list, like the controller, these are the controllers, the EZIO controllers. The transmitters are over there, the DC power supplies, all that's available to you in the trainers. And there are eight trainers. IP addresses for each one is listed on the sheet that's in front of you as well. Five of them are in this room. Three of them are, are in the next room, okay? Uh, the goal of the lesson. Um, so what we'd like to do is provide you with a four to 20 milliamp lesson plan uh, that touches on these topics, IO wiring, networking, uh, programming, basic electrical theory, and basic control theory. The learning objectives. Now these all start with action verbs. This is the blooms, okay? And the action verbs um, compare and contrast RTD th RTDs and thermistors, describe some advantages of 4 to 20 milliamp circuits, explain the components of 4 to 20 milliamp circuits, construct a 4 to 20 milliamp circuit, terminate control wires to control devices, create backnet objects in a programmable controller, and program a controller to meet a given sequence of operation. We got two and a half hours. We're going to do all that, <laughs> maybe. But that's what you should learn from this lesson. Can we shut that door just to keep sure. the voice down? Thank you. OK, so the hook of the set, we're not going to go through that. When you reflect on this, think about in your report outs how you would best engage students before you start the, the lesson, OK? Uh, we will talk about the instructional narrative. So when I thought about the importance of this lesson, this is what I came up with. And this is how this lesson will go. A significant percentage of, of the attendees, you, uh, are likely to be building automation instructors. How many are building automation instructors? OK, a couple, a few. How many are in related fields, though, teaching in related fields, like IT or electrical? OK. And how many do think that this will be a beneficial lesson to take home and to be able to use at your institution? So that's almost everybody. Um, OK, so the lesson starts with an introduction, expl explanation of purpose, uh, constructed in lesson plan format. We talked about this. Prior to the hands-on work, cognitive fundamentals will be discussed about 4 to 20 milliamp circuits. Uh, fundamental lessons include RTDs versus thermistors, 4 to 20 milliamp circuit um, fundamentals. We're not going to have time to talk about backnet objects and then maybe some key terms. Um, we'll go through uh, some of these, uh, discussion of some of these when we get in a little further into the PowerPoint. Uh, and then we've already split you into groups. During the instructional period, when I turn the controllers over to you guys, I'm going to be a guide on the side. I'm not going to provide all the answers. Problem-based learning. We've, we stressed the importance of problem-based learning in a lot of former um, workshops and this one because it's active learning, engaged learning. Hopefully, how many of you have your smartphones on you with access to the Google Drive? Okay, all the resources to complete the exercise are up there in cut sheets, in engineering data sheets, and they're all laid out for you. If you, if you need a device or some technical information about one of the devices you're going to be using, it's all there for you. So um, is everybody in two-man or two-person two teams? Three OK. So I mean, we got three, 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 two, okay. three. So what I'd suggest is, no, it's fine, it's fine. What I suggest is, is the person with more of the, the hands-on electrical skills, you work on the wiring part of it, and the other person may be, be the, the data digger the one who gets the data sheets and the one who records what you're learning through the lesson, okay? I'd split up your teams like that so we can, so we can get through it. What are the most likely things that could go wrong today? Uh, well, power, technology issues, internet, AV aids, 
We've surmounted a lot of those already. Okay. Um, AV issues with the projector. Okay. That seems to be working. Uh, network easy I.O. controllers accessible in A191. I've already checked that out before this morning. Um, participants miswiring the controllers and causing damage to expensive devices. So this is a big risk with people who are not really good with wiring, right? We always blow things up. But we don't want to add to Peter's budget. So before you apply power, have me or Ted come and check the wiring to make sure that everything's kosher before we flip the switch, OK? We'll all agree to do that, OK? Right? Cool. Uh, unruly or challenging participants. Who's unruly and who's going to be challenging today? OK, we're going to watch out for this guy. Ted, can you hover around this guy right here? Maybe, maybe Robert in the back. We already know him. So, And then power outage. Hopefully, we don't have a power outage during the exercise. Um, OK, so the, in the practice and application, we're going to move from a cognitive introduction quickly into hands-on exercise. That's basically what that's saying. And then assessment evaluation is simply pass-fail um, and uh, through your report outs at the end at 5 o'clock. Um, and then I'll sum up the instruction. And again, the scaffolding, this is all up to you when you go back to your home institution. Phew, I need some water. Um, the reason we went through that is because it's so important I can't stress enough to lay this out when you're doing exercises back home at your institution. So many of us don't do this. I was guilty of just going into a classroom unprepared. The more you can at least make an effort to do that, the more when you have somebody subbing for you, or the more when you're trying to improve the lessons and learn on what you did right or wrong, you can go back and add to it. I can't stress enough. If there's one thing I would say um, about technical education, this is the biggest failing in the country right now at the technical college level. And, and ask me why I say that after, afterwards. This is probably the biggest failing of technical instruction around the country right now. You agree, right? Because we're, not, we're considered as technical experts, experts in the classroom. But we aren't necessarily experts at teaching unless we take pains to, to really lay it out in an appropriate way. And I can say that from experience, OK. I'll, Talk to me later if you want more insight on that from my perspective. OK. So can you, Frank, can you yep. talk a little bit about how you construct the hook? Um, sure. So the hook or the set is um, before you can really have the attention of a group, <clears throat> you have to touch them here emotionally. You have to catch their interest. There are three domains of learning. There's the cognitive, the psychomotor, the hands-on psychomotor. And then the one that's often forgotten is the affective domain of learning. That's the heart. That's the emotional side. We've all been in the classroom, and we know when we have a class and when we don't have a class. When you don't have a class, when you haven't done a hook or brought them into the lesson, you're not teaching because you're not engaging them appropriately. They aren't listening. They're not focused. They're not retaining. And I think most of us probably know that. So it's important as an instructor, when you start a class, to make sure that you get them, you hook them, you set them for receiving education. That can be done by doing silly things like putting on a little costume and coming into the classroom or you know, just corny things. But you'd be surprised how much better your instruction will be if you think through how you're going to catch them and get their interest and then teach them something. And um, I would say, in my experience as a teacher, when I've done that appropriately, I've had great outcomes in retention and motivation of students. When I have not done that, I've been driven crazy. My students are crazy. There's not order in the classroom. So the hook or a set is very important to think through how you're going to catch their interest immediately and then keep it in that zone of learning. We've talked a lot about this in former workshops. If you have interest in learning more in depth about how we do it, take a look at the BAS workshop from last year, because we did a really good job of demonstrating first not getting attention and then looking at retention of topics, and then doing a hook in a set through a lesson plan. And we tested the group. And the results are proven right there. Everybody remembered the lesson so much better. And they could apply the material much better. And there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. But is that what you wanted to? OK, OK. OK, let's jump into a fundamental discussion of RTDs and thermistors. Because one of the things that we designed this lesson around was an RTD transmitter device, which we'll be using in these cases. We wanted to give you just a little bit of um, an appreciation of the difference between RTDs and thermistors and their application. RTDs, um, resistance temperature detectors, 
are usually made of a pure metal like platinum or nickel or copper, sometimes tungsten. And the reason is they have a fairly flat curve. It's almost linear through a very wide range of temperature sensing. Okay? Thermistors are usually made of some kind of composite material like a metal oxide with stabilizers and they can have any range of curves depending on the manufacturer. There are some standard curves out there. There are certainly standards uh, for RTDs um, as well which are easier to characterize across their range of sensing. Um, RTDs have a positive temperature correlation while thermistors have a negative temperature uh, correlation. So a, an increase in temperature results in a decrease in resistance for thermistors. An e increase in temperature for RTDs results in an increase in resistance, right? Okay, that's the difference. Um, RTDs, as I said, have a much longer range. It depends on the metal. Platinum is the most commonly used because it's stable and linear to approximately 600, 650 degrees Celsius. Whereas uh, composite material thermistors have a much smaller range, but they're less expensive. So there's pluses and minuses. In our field, we use a lot more thermistors because in the range of temperatures we typically sense, like in a room, uh, it works and they're cheaper than RTDs. But if, you, if you're looking at temperatures in an oven, let's say, or some kind of industrial process, you're going to be choosing RTDs over thermistors for sure because that's, that's the choice. Okay. Response time is slower in an RTD than it is in a thermistor. Okay, um, and here's just some other facts about uh, that. One interesting thing, um, calibration is easier in RTDs as you can imagine because it does have a fairly flat, a pretty, pretty flat curve actually uh, versus uh, in a thermistor. And you have less change in ohms per uh, degree change, right, in an RTD than you do in a thermistor. So if you change one degree Celsius, you're going to have a shorter, a smaller change in the ohms, the resistance, in an RTD than you will in a thermistor. Okay. And I say all that, and it turns out we're going to do a great lesson with RTDs, and I get out here, and we don't have any RTDs. So, but I wanted to deliver that to you anyways. We're going to be mimicking an RTD with a potentiometer, and those are in front of you right there, those blue potentiometers with a, with a, uh, you know, a little turn knob on them. Okay, um, this is from a Kelly catalog. Uh, just wanted to show you there are several different types of RTDs. Um, they have different accuracies depending on what kind of metal they are or how they're constructed. You can buy them like ultra um, accurate RTDs are a lot more expensive. Um, typically you'll see 100 ohm, 1000 ohm uh, platinum curves, 375, 385, that relates to the correlative factor between resistance and temperature change, okay? So if you had, for instance, at zero degrees, typically uh, is where you'd have 1,000 ohms in a 1,000 ohm RTD thermistor, I'm sorry, RTD. If you go up to 100 degrees Celsius, that resistance is gonna add 385 ohms. That's why it's a 385 curve. If it's a 375 curve, it would add 375 ohms. They make it sound, but it's really simple, the, the way that they come up with these. That's why the 385 and 375, if anybody ever wondered why that is. Okay, uh, this is a platinum 100 ohm at zero degrees Celsius RTD, and you can see it's not an exact linear relationship, but it's very close across a very wide scale of temperature sensing, and that's why platinum is very common. Copper turns out to be great as well, but what happens to copper, just like happens to iron? Oh, at a certain temperature, the higher temperature is going to cause corrosion, rust, right? So that's why we don't use copper. We use platinum instead. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to talk about thermocouples, but here's the relationship. There's the NTC, negative temperature coefficient for thermistors. RTDs have a positive, or PTC, positive temperature coefficient, okay? And, um, this table is here for your reference. If you're interested at like for a thousand ohm RTD at zero degrees Celsius, you see it's a thousand there. At a hundred, it's gonna be 1385. That's a 385 curve platinum RTD. Is this interesting to you guys? I, I just assumed a lot of times, I know when I did or got into controls, nobody ever really explained this stuff to me and I've learned it along the way. And so I thought I'd add it in here so you can just share it with your students. Okay. okay. So any questions on that before we get into 4 to 20 milliamp circuit basics? Okay. 
Okay, so again, four to 20 milliamp circuits are the most, probably the most common circuit that's out there, and they have a lot of advantages, but they're also the one circuit that is probably not, I would say, easy to wire. When you wire a thermistor, that's simple. There's no polarity, you just hire, work, hook up the two wires, simple. If you, if you wire up a voltage uh, input, you might have a positive and a negative, and that goes to the positive and the ne and negative on the input. That's pretty easy too, right? But when you have a 4 to 20 milliamp circuit, you actually have to think. And you have to have some kind of schema to understand what's going on. Because you have minuses connected to pluses, and pluses connected to minuses, and minuses connected to minuses, and pluses connected to pluses. That makes no sense whatsoever, does it? That's why students get confused. And that's why teachers get confused when you're, when you're teaching it. How many here have a good foundation for wiring 4 to 20 milliamp circuits? Like if I were to ask you right now <clears throat> to wire one up with a transmitter, a DC power supply, and a receiver, okay, we got one. How many others could do it? Three, four, five. I mean, I used to teach electronics, so I mean, I'm not okay. necessarily really knowledgeable in this particular field of it, but yeah. I've built lots of circuits. Okay. So we'll, we'll okay, you're in the group. You're one of the five, Sean. You can do it too. But that's still a, a minor percentage of people in here. My goal today is that all of you, when you leave, will be able to wire this up from memory. Uh, a few basics about the circuit. Current flows the same in the same amount through every component of the circuit. Okay, all components are going to drop voltage along the way, and this is important because this is going to tie into an analogy for remembering how to wire these. <clears throat> they're insensitive to electrical interference noise, very insensitive to that, right? They're not going to pick up uh, stray signals and add voltage and mess up your signal. They're very stable circuits. Um, they have a live zero. How many know what a live zero means? You do. Can you explain it real quick to the group? So the best way I always have to describe it is a live zero. If you cut a wire and it's not um, a live zero signal, you don't know the wire's cut. Great explanation, great explanation. And um, it, it allows for an alarm condition even when nothing's going on in the circuit. When it's at just at a stable four milliamp state and you really don't have the transmitter sending much of a signal, it gives you uh, an indication that you have a complete path for current flow, that you have continuity, that you have a DC power supply, that your transmitters, you know, it tells you a lot of stuff immediately. And, it, and the reason for that is how many have had experience in pneumatics? In the pneumatic world, there was what, a three to 15, the same thing, we had a live zero pressure of three PSI, G, for the same reason. We wanted to know if, it's, if a tube was cut, right? We wanted to know if, we, if the compressor is maintaining pressure. It just tells you the same stuff that in the old pneumatic systems that you have a live zero. So it, it's very useful. Uh, the components of a, of a four to 20 milli milliamp circuit include a power supply, it can be a deep C or an AC power supply. In two wire circuits, it's always DC. And that's what we're gonna be doing today. But there are three wire transmitter circuits where you can have a power supply of AC and the rectification is done at the transmitter and then you have a DC signal. But typically they're, they're encountered in two wire DC power supply circuits, okay? Um, the receiver resistor is typically a 250 ohm resistor that's found back at the receiving device. The receiving device is, a con is the controller. In our world, BAS is gonna be the controller. This is gonna be your receiver. And because of that, it's considered a sinking four to 20 milliamp circuit. There are controllers that can provide or act as a transmitter and provide um, that current from the device itself. That's a sourcing, okay? In this case, we're doing a two wire, four to 20 milliamp sinking circuit, okay? You'll hear that sometimes, not very often, syncing and sourcing circuits. I just wanted to let you know what that means. Um, <clears throat> okay, so if you use Ohm's law, as Ted was talking about, and you do a simple calculation, it's a DC circuit, right? So you can do a quick calculation there. You'll see that, it, that a four to 20 milliamp will convert, if you have a 250 ohm resistor in parallel, will drop to a one VDC to five VDC signal, okay? So four milliamps would show as one volt DC at the controller. 20 milliamps would show as five volt DC at the controller. 
Why is that important? It's a lot easier to measure voltage with a microcontroller than it is to measure current. And so while when we get into the software, you'll see you have a selection of a, of a zero. It's a little bit different in the Sedona platform. They call it a zero to 20 milliamp. They mean four to 20 milliamp. But the guys who set this up really are not HVAC guys, so there's a little quirky stuff there. So you'll select a zero to 20 milliamp uh, scale, right? <clears throat> Really, it's a one to five volt DC. Honestly, that's what the controller sees. But the, that's what you'll select when we set up the software for this, okay? Okay, so the receiver component, like we talked about, receives that VAS signal. Okay, so here it is. Here's the circuit. Um, this is a two wire transmitter circuit. Again, it's a syncing circuit from the perspective of the microcontroller. Okay, we start at the DC power supply. Always when you're thinking about four to 20 milliamp circuits, Think about the excitation source. That term is often used in 4 to 20 milliamp circuits. It simply means your power supply. It's a fancy way to say your DC power supply. That's your DC excitation for the circuit. Uh, you start off of the plus side, okay? You go through a wire here. That's the resistance of the wire. It depends on how long that wire is run, how much resistance it's going to be. And then you get to the transmitter. The transmitter is the heart of the circuit, okay? You come into the plus side of the transmitter. The transmitter is going to send a signal, a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, that is um, correlated to the parameter which is being measured. The parameter being measured could be temperature, it could be pressure, it could be GPMs through, through a pipe. It could be any range of physical parameters going through um, that being measured and then linearized and sent in a signal by that transmitter. The transmitter is the heart of the circuit. Remember that. Teach your students that. The transmitter is the heart of the circuit. It's the brains, it's the pump, it's, it's everything, okay? Then you have the wire coming back to the receiver. This is the controller. This is the input on the controller. So for us, in our exercise, it might be universal input one, okay? We have a dropping resistor or a receiving resistor of 250 ohms. And then we have the input um, ground, sometimes it's, Controls manufacturers don't do a good job of, of having a consistent way that they refer to this. On this controller, it's common, which drives me crazy because that's another thing that students get confused with. Common, you know, they get, anyways. Uh, some have it ground. Ground's a better term because this is, you pretty much used up all the energy of the circuit when you get to this point. You're at the bottom of the waterfall. Then you, you come back to the DC power supply. It's like a pump. You're at a higher excitation voltage, okay? But whatever it's called, this is your receiver right here. This is your input, that's your ground or common. And then in parallel with that is a resistor. This is what converts that 4 to 20 milliamp circuit into a voltage that's measured right there at your receiving device. Now let me stop. How many people are confused? Do you have questions? Anything not clear at this point? Okay? Cool. Okay. So we move forward. <clears throat> so this is, I've, I've shared analogies actually in this room, different ways of thinking about it, triangle. This, I was thinking yesterday, what's a better way I can really explain this that you won't forget and that will not confuse students and that you can take away and wire from memory. And this is what I came up with and you guys can use it if it makes sense or not. Okay, so when you think about a basic two wire, four to 20, 20 milliamp circuit, think about a waterfall. Okay, at the top of the waterfall, if you were to pump water up there, it would, take, it would take energy, it would take a pump to get that water up to that higher potential energy. Think of that as your DC power supply and start at the very top. Think about positive at the very top. That's the most positive, the highest level you can get to, the most positive part of the circuit. That's gonna have the highest DC voltage. Everything else, falls down, lower voltage, lower voltage, lower voltage until you get to here. So if you think about it that way, positive up here, okay, and wire that positive of DC to, the, to positive here and you're dropping voltage across the transmitter. You're at a lower voltage here because you're lower on that waterfall. You fall a little bit further, come into the positive because this is more positive than this, right? You're at a lower level, but this still has some voltage, so that's positive, that's negative, and then you just come back to the, 
the other side of the DC power supply. The negative, in this case, is the lowest level. It's like this ground level of the waterfall. Think of it that way. Think of you dropping voltage through every component of the circuit. You start high from the DC power supply, and then you drop, and then you drop, and then you drop, and then you, you're down at the base, and then you have to pump it back up with DC power supply. Does that seem like a good analogy to remember? You'll never mess up the wiring if you, if you have that analogy in mind. When you wire these components, you'll never mess it up, at least on this circuit. Um, but that's the analogy we're going to use today, OK? Any questions? All right. We're going to add one more component just, just to prove that this holds and also to reinforce that analogy. So in this circuit, we're going to add an LCD indicator. And an LCD indicator, uh, there's one in the last trainer there on the, the bottom. Um, yeah, it's just sitting there on the, OK, I'll grab it. It's just a three and a half digit LCD indicator. This is going to be added to the circuit, okay? And it's going to be in, it's going to carry through the same amount of current as all the other devices in the circuit, but it's going to give you an indication of what's going on in the circuit. And for the purposes of this exercise, you're going to get a value here. You're going to change the zero on this display, and you're going to try to match this to what you're going to be reading in the controller software, okay? It'll be kind of your check. It'll help you calibrate the circuit. And um, it'll be challenging, but maybe some of you can, can get that far to where you match this with what you're seeing on your screen at the end. Because it is reading the same current. It's just a matter of scaling it and getting the span correct, and we'll talk about how, how to do that. OK, so back to our analogy. OK, top of the waterfall, positive out of the DC power supply. The first device we hit, because it's the heart of the circuit, is the transmitter. We drop voltage across the transmitter. Then we come out of the negative side because that's the lower side of the transmitter into the LCD indicator, going into the positive side of that, coming out of the negative side, dropping voltage across that too. Then we're coming over to the input, which is our receiving device on the positive side, dropping voltage there. We got no more voltage here. That's our bottom. That's our ground. We're at ground level. We're at the bottom of the circuit. We come back into the bottom side of the DC power supply and we pump it back up to the top of the waterfall. Easy. If you think about it like that, it's easy. You won't mess it up. If you try to memorize the transmitter negative goes to the positive of the, and the negative here and the negative of the receiver goes to the negative, you're going to mess it up. Okay? So if anybody's got a better way, you know, share it. But for me, I think this is the best way that I can remember the circuit. Okay, so here it is in the analogy of the waterfall. <clears throat> You're pumping up that, you, your excitation voltage here, the top of the waterfall, then you're falling. You're dropping voltage across the transmitter, dropping voltage across the LCD, dropping voltage across the receiver, the controller, and then you're back at ground level, okay? Any questions? You're gonna wire that circuit up in just a few minutes, okay? Okay, these are the components we're gonna use for the exercise. We're gonna use a DC power supply from Kelly called a DCP, DC power supply, 1.5W watts from Ted's discussion, right? This is what you'll see on the DC power supply. The DC power supplies are right here. There's two of them in each one of the trainers, and they have four connections, okay? Two of the connections are for 24 AC. That just powers the DC power supply. The other two are, are the DC power. So if you go back, the ones that's part of this circuit are the DC side of that circuit. The AC side is just providing power to the DC power supply itself, okay? In the trainers, we have a, a yellow and a blue wire coming off of two transformers in the back of the trainers. You can take your meters and verify that that's 24 AC and just run two wires to the DC power supply. Either one, it doesn't matter, okay? It might be easier if you run to the one that has the transmitter over top of it just because you'll be wiring to that as well. But it doesn't really matter which one you wire it to. Make sure that when you do that, okay, uh, you make use of the terminal blocks. I've seen when I was taking the wires loose, I saw all kinds of crazy stuff in these trainers where people were pulling off and trying to use this as a node for three or four wires jammed into one wheel and connector and all kinds of stuff you usually see in the field. But remember, you have these terminal blocks. You can come off the top of these 
and make it easy on yourself. You shouldn't have to use any wire nuts or anything like that. Okay. Okay. Then we have um, the transmitter. This is the heart of the DC circuit, right? The four to twenty milliamp circuit. The, D, uh, the, the transmitter device. With the transmitter device, you also have four wires. You're going to use the two loop wires. One's positive, one's negative. Can't get any easier than that, right? You're going to drop the voltage across that device. And if you look at this little schematic from the cut sheet, you'll see exactly what we talked about. Here's the, the DC power supply, the highest level of excitation in the circuit, going over to the loop transmitter, the positive side. You drop voltage down that waterfall. You come out, you go over uh, to the uh, receiver device, which is your controller, to the positive side. You drop more voltage. You're at the bottom of the, the waterfall. You come back to the power supply. Simple, right? Pretty simple when you think about it that way. Okay. I'm sorry, the, the transmitter devices are right here, right above the DC power supply are the transmitter devices. Okay. And then the, the LCD indicator, this is a three and a half digit LCD indicator. There are four connections on the back of it. You'll see one says BL. It's not for black wires. It is for backlighting. You don't need it. If you get that far, you're welcome to wire it up uh, and power it up. You'll see the, the, uh, the LCD really light up a lot better, but you don't need it. The only thing you need are the signal, the two signal uh, uh, terminals, and they're, they're marked positive and negative. Again, in this circuit, we've added another component. So you start with the power supply, come into the transmitter, out the transmitter, into the LCD um, display, drop some more voltage, Back to the receiver, drop some more voltage, you're back at the bottom of the waterfall on the negative side of the DC power supply. Is this very clear? I want to make sure it's very clear. Is there any question in anybody's mind how to wire this circuit? Can you go home and teach this to your students now? Do you feel, after we do it, I'm going to ask you that question. Robert? Of course, of course. You think it's going to be this easy? No. Of course. <laughs> for you for you overachievers, I'll be expecting you to get the span and the zero correct, Robert, and it calibrated properly since you've been teaching for years. I expect that. <laughs> you got to represent GPTC. Come on, we're both from the same school, right? OK, so um, the other thing that we have are a couple actually high dollar pots. And it's not the kind of pot you usually talk about on the West Coast. These are potentiometers. OK, so the potentiometers are 10K ohm. They've got like a ton of turns. You could turn it probably 20 times to go from one side to the other. But you can range this down to about 10 ohms all the way up to, I don't know, probably 100K ohms, something like that. Um, what we're going to do is try to just simulate an RTD, a 385 curve RTD. So if you remember, on that, uh, on that spreadsheet that I shared with you. These transmitters are looking for a 385 curve RTD. At zero degrees Celsius, it should be 1,000 ohms. At 100 degrees Celsius boiling, it should be 1,385 ohms. That's the whole range you're really going to be using on these pots. And that's going to simulate a 4 to 20 milliamp circuit. OK, so when you turn that thing, you should be seeing a change uh, in the controls from 4 to 20 milliamps when you set up that point of that object. You should also be seeing a similar change in your LCD. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Okie dokie. And then finally, we have the EZIO FG32 Plus. It doesn't really matter who control, what the controller it is, the wiring is exactly the same. You're going to have an input and you're going to have a ground or a common. The wiring is exactly the same on any controller for a tw four, to tw tw uh, four to 20 milliamp loop. Now, one thing, again, you got to be careful of the wiring diagrams. I pulled this right off of ECIO's website. They do not show a dropping resistor. They do not show a 250 ohm parallel resistor. If you wire it without one, it's not going to blow anything up. But that transmitter light will be very dim because it's going to be sinking way too much current into this device. And, and the, the power supply is not going to be able to compensate. 
you'll notice the circuit will work correctly when you put the resistors in parallel with that input. So you just go between the input and the ground with a 250 ohm resistor. That's another thing we didn't have. We had 560 ohm resistors, so I gave you two. So what are we going to do with those? We're going to put them in parallel. And we're not going to be 250, but we'll be close, 280 ohms or thereabouts. Close enough to make the circuit work, OK? OK? OK, so this is the assignment. First of all, let's check again. Any other questions? Anything you want to cover again before we get into the, get into the uh, other part of it, the wiring? That wasn't bad, 40 minutes to get through that. Everybody good? OK. So in this exercise, you'll be constructing a 4 to 20 milliamp two-wire transmitter circuit, syncing circuit, which includes a loop-powered LCD three-and-a-half-digit display. The parameter driving the 4 to 20 milliamp circuit will be resist resistive via the 10K ohm potentiometer that you have in front of you. And those things are 30 bucks a piece, by the way. I don't, I don't know why. You can get them from DigiKey, but they're, they're precision. That's all we had. That's, I don't know why we had them. Um, the 4 to 20 milliamp circuit will be received by the EZIO FG32+. Uh, you can put it on any input of your choice. Now you, I'd suggest input one, but whatever you want to use over there is fine. Like, is that a digital input? Or? Uh, universal input, I'm sorry. You've got eight universal inputs on these, I think. Or actually these have 12, 16 universal inputs. Okay. Any one of them is fine. You'll just have to set the channel appropriately when you get into the software. Okay, um, once the circuit's constructed and checked by an instructor, do not apply power until it's checked by an instructor. Uh, one of the trainings we had for the HPBOP experience guy, so he had worked 20 some years in controls, whatever. How, I mean, he blew stuff up in the back. I would have never thought. It's like, you remember that? Smoked this and smoked a controller, and I'm like, okay, what have you been doing for 20 years? But um, anyways, anybody can blowing stuff up for 20 years, maybe. I don't know, but you'd be surprised how quick, just one little mistake. It's always good to get another set of eyes. We would never let te uh, students turn on anything until we as instructors really check that wiring. So let us check the wiring first, please. Okay, uh, your team will create an associated object in EZIO, cpt.exe. We'll go through how to do that in just a minute. And you'll use a scale of zero to 100%. These are all set the ones in front of you as temperature devices. There is a jumper, and I'll draw it up on the board, that you need to change once you set up the circuit to go to percentage. I wish they had one for KW, but they don't, so we're going to go with percentage. And we're going to scale it to 0 to 100 percent, corresponding to a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Some of you won't get that far, but if you wire up the circuit, we get the object created. The next step is to scale that LCD from 0 to 100 percent, so we can match it to what we're going to see in our, in our controls. Um, the goal for the circuit, get the LCD indicator and the EZIO universal input object to match nearly exactly. They're not going to match exactly because we don't have a precision 250 ohm dropping receiving resistor, but we can get them pretty close. Okay. Um, okay, the universal input object, okay, use the documentation provided to change units and zero and span pots on the LCD indicator. Do you guys know what those are? On the out back of the LCD, you have these little blue square looking boxes that have little white paint on them to hold them in place. Those are our zero and span potentiometers. You have to get a control screwdriver, and if you're like me, I gotta get glasses to see them. There's one that's gonna say zero, and there's one that's gonna say span. And that's how you're gonna change what's displayed on the LCD indicator. And the documentation in Google, Google Drive will show you exactly how to do that and put that in there for you to, uh, to get to. And if you run into problems, I, I, I'll be floating around uh, as well to help. Okay, once the circuit's created, we want to create two digital outputs as well. If we can get this far, we're going to use those as load shedding points based on what we're, we're going to be dialing in with our potentiometer. We're going to try to shed two different loads. And you can choose your shed points, just put in a differential as well for dropping them out and bringing them back, okay? Um, I don't know if we're going to get that far on time. 
if you work in groups of two to three, it's important that at least one person of your group has prior wiring experience. Okay, all control devices and tools are provided to complete the assignment. Resource documents and this PowerPoint are available on Google Drive. I'll show you where in just a second. Uh, we'll be calling out every 30 minutes, you know, how much time you've got left. And with about 10 minutes left, we'll ask you to start wrapping it up. Okay. At 5 o'clock, I think we're doing report outs here, right, with the group, or are we going back? We're going back there. Yeah, I think we're going back. Okay, so we'll have to definitely start wrapping up 10 minutes prior to so we can be over there in, in time to do the report outs with the other group. Okay, things to pay attention to, reliable, repeatable terminations. I've never said that before in any workshop. This is the first time. <laughs> do not apply power until instructors check your circuit. Document what you've learned along the way. This is important. This is part of your report out. Um, be resourceful. This is PBL, so not all the answers can be provided. Along the way, I'll draw up a suggested circuit. I'd like you to think about it first. You know how to wire a 4 to 20 milliamp circuit now. All of you should be able to wire it up. Just thinking about that waterfall analogy, I'd like you to do that as the first part of the assignment. Just try to wire that up. Do a little schematic and just, just go for it. 30 minutes in, I'll draw a schematic up on the board, but hopefully by that time you've all assembled your circuit. I assembled it this morning, the whole start to finish in about 30 minutes, but it's my assignment, and I've done it before. Um, it's, it, 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 and I knew what to do, but I followed the same procedure that you guys are going to be following. So I, I assume that some of you will be able to finish, some of you won't be able to finish, um, but that's okay. Uh, we don't have any safety goggles. Um, I, I put you back a row because we were having some water leak problems, so you shouldn't have any problems with that in your rows. Take care with the wire strippers. When I was messing with this circuit last night, if you look at those wire strippers, um, they're their combination um, crimper on the bottom, and they have a nasty little pinch point. Oh, yeah, they do. I hate those things. I never use those because of that. I always catch my thumb in those things, and it'll take a chunk out of your thumb. That's why I never have my guys use those crimpers. Beware of that. Also, stranded wires from the, the stranded copper are, act as a double as a hypodermic needles. I mean, honestly, those things will get all the way into your skin. Watch out for that, too. When you strip the wires, if you have little shards of, of copper, make sure that you clean that up because they will get in somebody's skin and they're hard to get out. Okay, uh, report outs, two to three minutes. What we're looking for, did you complete the assignment? Did your circuit work? What did you learn? What would you change? How would you improve the exercise? And how do you rate your team performance? Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so the first thing I would do I'm going to do a quick intro into EZIO as well. The first thing I'd start to think about, though, when I release you guys is that circuit. Taking the components, going to your station, laying it out, maybe get a, a basic plan, basic schematic first, and then wiring it up. And um, like I said, in 30 minutes or so, I'll draw a circuit up on the board for those of you who are having problems. Next, we're going to get into the EZIO real quick. Um, Ted put together a nice little presentation about logging into the trainers. We'll help you with this as well. <clears throat> okay, so to log into these trainers, we, we've checked that every station can log into its respective trainer. In fact, all of you can log into the same trainer. That's why you have your specific IP address so that you're not gonna log into somebody else's trainer and claim their, uh, their work for your own or, or mess them up and be the only one who does it right, right? So um, the power should already be on your computers. When you start it up, you will choose an operating system um, or, or, or a platform to boot into. And you have ECT and controls. You'll boot into controls. Again, we'll be floating if you have any problems. You'll see this screen. Um, you may have to enter a password. The password is just Laney. It's right, right, uh, okay, it's not up there. It's just Laney, L-A-N-E-Y, lowercase. That's all you need. Okay, then you'll see an easy I-O, um, well, they'll ask you to check for web control connection. To all, the, all the computers, you shouldn't have any problem with this. We checked that all of them, by default, go to web, web control B. You'll look for this folder. You'll click on the easy I-O folder. 
Then you look for CPT, DEV. You look for CPT, the executable file, .exe. You start that, and then you put in the IP address, which I put on that sheet of paper in front of your station. Okay, and then you hit open, and no password, you just hit enter. Now, I don't care about this, you remembering this, we'll help you get into, when you're at that point, just call on us, we'll get you into the controller. So don't worry about that so much, but that's how you'll get into it. I'm more concerned about you finishing the circuit. And then uh, when you get to that point, we'll, I'll do a little, quick little demonstration about how to create objects in the EZIO environment, okay? But let's see if we can get that circuit done in the next 45 minutes or so, so that we can move on to the next phase of creating objects, okay? Uh, uh -huh. Well, in, in this area here, they've all logged on to the wireless network for controls, yeah. oh. not the general He's the expert, so if we burn it, it's, it's his fault. No way. <laughs> if it's good, then. You see the guy wiring? <laughs> he knows what he's doing. 